Let's cry together. Uh, loving Father, uh, by your Spirit, I uh, pray that you help us uh, to listen attentively to this uh, familiar story of Christmas with our hearts and minds open to what it means for us and how we can know you better. For we pray in Jesus' name. Uh, well, if you've got kids and you can remember the time before they were born, uh, you might remember reading something like uh, what to expect when you were expecting, uh, to try to understand what was involved uh, in the birth and the early stages of a baby's life. Uh, before the births of our boys, Lucy was into a good podcast called Australian Birth Stories, uh, which helps you to know what kinds of things to expect in Australia. Uh, before, dur before, during, and after the birth. I uh, know they're just Australian. Uh, now you can learn a bit about what's involved in a birth uh, before it actually happens, but there's not a lot you can guess about what your baby's going to be like after they're born. Uh, as we come to the story of Jesus' birth this morning, uh, that's way truer for Mary, isn't it? Uh, what was Mary to expect when she was expecting? What kind of birth story would she be telling in a podcast? So I don't know if there's much uh, that would have helped her know what birthing and raising the Son of God would involve. As we saw in chapter 1, uh, there's been a lot of unexpected things surrounding the news of Jesus coming already. Luke's not shying away from telling us all the strange things about this birth story. And so we should be asking, why did God do it this way? And what was God thinking in bringing his son into the world like this? What kind of God would make it happen like this? Uh, well, this morning we're going to see that the way God brings his Messiah and king into the world uh, tells us something about what kind of king he is. It tells us what kind of kingdom he's building uh, so let's get started in this second unusual chapter of Luke's Gospel. Uh, if you've got your Bibles open, uh, first you'll notice the unusual detail we get about Mary's birth story. Uh, the first unusual detail is that there was a census being taken at the same time as Mary's due date. Uh, it's not just any old census either. This was a census of the entire Roman world. Uh, a lot of people back then would have thought that was the whole world. They would have spoken it as an, a census of the entire world. Look at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. Now, there's a few reason why, uh, reasons why Luke includes this detail. Uh, on the one hand, Luke's being a good historian. Uh, he's giving us a timestamp. Uh, these are clear and dateable events in history. Uh, we also have two ruling figures mentioned, Caesar Augustus, a Roman ruler, Quirinius, uh, the governor of Syria. Uh, but I reckon there's something, Luke's do something else Luke's doing here. See, Luke's mate Theophilus, we, we met him back in chapter 1. Uh, we briefed him, uh, mentioned briefly mentioned him a couple of weeks ago. He's the guy Luke's writing to, probably a, pa a patron of Luke. Uh, well, Luke wants to give Theophilus and his mates a window into the wisdom of God. Luke's getting Theophilus and whoever else is reading with him to think back to Isaiah. Uh, they're probably familiar with the Bible, the Old Testament. And, they, and Luke points them back to Isaiah uh, to this promise that the Messiah would show up in Nazareth. Uh, and there's another Old Testament, Old Testament promise Luke wants them to think about here. Uh, this one's not about Nazareth now, but Bethlehem. And so this census turns out to be uh, the mechanism that brings Mary and Joseph to the prophesied location of Bethlehem. See, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we read, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So it was prophesied that a ruler of Israel would come out of Bethlehem. Uh, and as it turns out, this census turns out to be uh, God's, me God's means 
of fulfilling this promise that the king would come from Bethlehem. So so by the hand of God and the wisdom of God, this Roman census provides the occasion for the king to come out of Bethlehem. I reckon there's still another reason why Luke records this census here, and that is that uh, with the birth of a new king comes the birth of a new kingdom. I see this census was Rome kind of flexing its muscles. Uh, This was Caesar making a mirror uh, out of his own kingdom to, to reflect his own glory to himself in a way, to show himself how great he'd become, how, how far his rule extended. Uh, it was also about gauging how much money should be flowing through the kingdom and how much more money he should be getting from people like Mary and Joseph, who have travelled all the way to Bethlehem uh, to register their names in the kingdom of Rome. And so conducting a census of the Roman world was this enormous feat. It was a sign of the greatness of the kingdom of Rome. But I wonder uh, if Luke's making a point here. See, as one kingdom tallies its multitudes, another kingdom begins. Not with a crowd uh, that gets that gets counted, uh, but with a total of one, one little baby. Luke tells us in verse 6, while they were there for this census in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born, and Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Uh, So just as Caesar goes about measuring the net worth of the world, a new king turns up as a baby, and a new kingdom begins. Uh, But this is the strange and astonishing wisdom of God, that in the midst of this tally of Roman strength, he would send a weak little baby, the tiniest blip on Rome's Rome's radar, uh, who would become the true ruler of the world. Now, you'd expect uh, that with the coming of a new king, there'd be some celebration in Bethlehem, bring on a party of royal proportions. This is the king of the world, after all. Uh, And yet what we see next is that no one wants to host this king. Luke tells us that no one in Bethlehem makes way for this king. There's no royal parade. In fact, no one is willing to give up their place for this preg- for his pregnant mum, Mary, let alone the fact that she's carrying the saviour of the world. So Luke tells us plainly that the Lord Jesus started his life on earth in a hay trough. Look at verse 7. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for him. I told you the other week about uh, my hometown, Corrigai, New South Wales, and, and has a, have, there's a road there named Queen Elizabeth Drive. Uh, but when the king of the world turns up in Bethlehem, there's no road named after him. Uh, in David's own city, no one saying joy to the world, the Lord is come. Uh, and to the shame of our world today, these Christmas carols are sung each year. We sing, let earth receive her king. Uh, we sing, let every heart prepare him room. But the gospel so often falls on deaf ears. Now, who is preparing room in their hearts for the Lord Jesus? Uh, Christmas comes around each year. It's the same story. Uh, there's just no room for Jesus in our celebrations. Uh, we can, we, even as God's people, we can sit around the table and there's food and drink. Uh, I don't know if anyone puts those paper crowns on your head you get for Christmas. Uh, there's a crackers. With, um, but there's a gentle rebuke here uh, for all of us at Christmas uh, to just to, to stop uh, and to remember who's the real, who the real king is. Uh, to remember the wisdom of God. Uh, to remember that Christmas is about the king who deserves the highest place at the table. Uh, the one who wears the eternal crown. Uh, at Christ's birth, he wasn't given that place. He wasn't given that crown. Uh, and, and he often continues to be ignored in our world today. Uh, so we've got to remember to host the king at Christmas. As the carol says, prepare him room. Uh, I don't mean to leave a seat at the table for Jesus or do any kind of funny stuff like that. I mean, let's make sure he's the, he's the Lord of our hearts. Uh, that he's in our conversations. That we spend time reflecting on his coming both as a baby uh, and his coming uh, again when he returns. 
uh, that, that the word Advent, I don't know if you know the, the meaning of Advent, it just means coming. And so Christians traditionally have thought of Advent as a time of reflecting on his first coming as well as his second coming. Little side note. Uh, now, even though the world didn't recognise this baby as its king, uh, even though hardly anyone came to see him at his birth, even though he was given nowhere to stay in town, uh, things take a turn at this point. Uh, so you listen to what Luke says next. He says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Uh, if we think about it, this is actually a, a very unexpected turn in the story. A baby, the king, is born in the town of Bethlehem, and next thing the camera zooms out of Bethlehem, pans across to some fields in the night. Uh, if it was live TV, you'd wonder if the cameraman had kind of fallen asleep as it turns into these dark fields. Uh, so what do shepherds have to do with the birth of a king? It's all a little bit strange. Uh, and it would have been just as strange for Mary. It would have been strange for the shepherds themselves. Uh, Luke says in verse 8, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I wonder what that would be like to have an angel appear to you. I see, if you think about it, these shepherds were used to working night shift uh, out in the paddock. In those days, they didn't drive around in, uh, in land cruisers with big spotties on the front or anything like that. Uh, these shepherds are used to spending long hours in the dark, in the dim light of the moon. But then this angel appears out of nowhere. Uh, and what I suspect was actually even more terrifying was that the glory of the Lord, it says, Luke says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. It encompassed them. Uh, the Scottish preacher Sinclair Ferguson, Ferguson says, uh, the shepherds were not afraid of the dark, but they were afraid of the light. And the Bible talks about this day coming when everything will be laid bare, exposed to the light before God. I wonder if these shepherds might have felt like that, like that was happening to them there and then that night. Uh, but that's not actually what God was doing, was it? His glory wasn't shining around them to expose them for judgment. Uh, instead, the angel actually says to them in verse 10, Do not be afraid. I bring good news. Good news that will cause great joy for all the people. God was sending good news into the world, into a dark world. He was sending the good news to those living in darkness, as Isaiah had once said. Uh, in coming to these shepherds who are out in the fields in the dark night, God enacts actually what he's going to do for the whole world. God is bringing the light of salvation to call people out of darkness, uh, out of this rejection of his king and into relationship with him. Uh, now, if we're wondering why this angel shows up to the shepherds, it's because God is a God of grace. Uh, just like that announcement to Mary, this announcement comes to lowly people. Uh, and, and we see this in what the angel says next. Look at verse 11. Uh, Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. I wonder if you caught something in that verse. Uh, the angel doesn't just say a saviour has been born. He says to these shepherds, a saviour has been born to you, to shepherds. Uh, shepherds were actually seen as a grubby, uh, despised people. It was very low uh, employment in that day. They were despised people. Uh, but God doesn't discriminate. Uh, his grace comes to all people. People in the dark, low, uh, people on the low on the social ladder, and that's the beauty of Christmas. That's this good news that causes great joy for all the people, even shepherds. Uh, see, if you, and, and if you've been living in the darkness, if you'd be terrified by the glory of the Lord if it came and shone around you, if you're afraid of being exposed. Or hear this good news today. Know God's grace. 
the good news of the Saviour has come into the world. The Saviour has been born to you. You don't have to have it all together to accept Christ as your Lord. He doesn't discriminate against grubby sinners. In fact, no one becomes one of God's people unless they first realise that they are a grubby sinner. Uh, but this is the grace of God. He calls us out of darkness. He calls us out of darkness and into his, the light of his Son, Colossians tells us. Now, the Lord and King who was born at Christmas. Which brings us to one last thing. See, is this Roman decree still uh, hangs in the still night air of Bethlehem? Another decree has been sounded out in the fields. Good news has come to these shepherds, that a new kingdom has come. It's funny, isn't it, that Luke started this chapter by telling us of a kingdom decree, of the, a census of the whole world, that he is the beginning of a very different kingdom. Uh, this is a kingdom in which lowly shepherds uh, and lowly virgins are counted and included and even visited by the glory of the Lord himself. And what Luke shows us next is that this decree of a new kingdom won't be held back any longer, uh, neither in heaven nor on earth. See, uh, along with this good news, this angel brings, uh, Luke tells us a great company of, of the heavenly host appears. Uh, all these angels show up, uh, they're brimming with excitement at this news. A heaven is thrilled, and these angels just can't wait to proclaim the news of the birth of the Lord. And so they join together, praising God and saying in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. And just as heaven can't hold back this good news, the shepherds can't hold back either. In verse 15, Luke says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I see that's what this news, this good news is for. It actually, it comes to be proclaimed. It's come so that this new kingdom might be extended into the world. And so that more darkness, that darkness might be occupied by the light. And if God uses these despised shepherds, then he can use us too. See, we've been given the task to see many more people in, in this dark world come to the light. Uh, it's our job to invite people to come. Uh, to come and find this Saviour uh, and be welcomed into his kingdom just like Mary, just like these grubby shepherds. Uh, now, two weeks ago, we began with Luke's opening verses. Now, he was saying that he's written his story down, warts and all, uh, so that we might have certainty in the things that have been taught. Uh, well, we've seen this certainty in the response of both Mary and the shepherds. See, in the final, these final verses, Luke tells us that, uh, that Mary treasured up all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Has she seen the Lord's hand in everything that's come about since Gabriel first appeared to her nine months ago or, or thereabouts uh, and told her she was going to have, uh, give birth to Israel's eternal king? Through to these shepherds visiting her and proclaiming this good news to the world, uh, Mary has certainty. Uh, what a thing to be part of, to have experienced God's grace in such special ways. Uh, and she treasures and ponders these things in her heart. Then we have these shepherds in verse 20 who return glorifying and praising God for all the things they'd seen and heard, which were just as they'd been told. I uh, see these shepherds have certainty too. Uh, we've really only just scratched the surface here. These two chapters are just the beginning of all that Luke has to teach us about finding certainty. Uh, but I hope that the time we've spent together in these two chapters so far in Luke's Gospel will have given you greater certainty. A certainty that God keeps his promises. 
certainty in the grace of God for people like us. Our certainty is that a Saviour has been born to you. And that while this census was being carried out in Rome, the one who really counts is Jesus himself. And certainty then that you're counted in God's kingdom too. Uh, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that uh, for anyone here who hasn't trusted this good news that you might help uh, help them to believe, to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, born at Christmas, and to come and die for sins, to be resurrected, uh, that we might have life uh, eternally. Father, for all of us, we pray that you give us certainty in this good news of the, new, of the, of the King, Jesus. Certainty that that our lives are not lived in vain following him. Uh, Father, help us to trust him, to trust uh, this good news of, uh, of your promises being fulfilled, this good news of your grace that comes to people like us, the good news of a king who rules in, in faithfulness and goodness and grace for eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name.